Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Can I Distinguished webinar, the first of the academic year, with our very special guests from LAM Research, a Fortune 500 company and global leader in the semiconductor industry. Very quickly, here are a few webinar reminders. If you have any AV issues, use the chat icon and our tech will assist. Please submit all of your questions for the panel discussion through the Q&A feature, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Before we begin, I'd like to play a short video that highlights some of LAM's transformative impacts. inspiring to see a Caltech alum build such an extraordinary legacy. I am thrilled to welcome our guests here today. Our distinguished speaker is Tim Marcher, President and CEO of LAM Research. Tim is very familiar with Caltech and especially so with the Fleming House. He earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in Applied Physics here in 1989. And I should mention that Applied Physics is in part my department, so this is a great connection. Tim also completed the program of management development at the Harvard Graduate School of Business. Today, Tim drives the strategic agenda and vision for LAM research. And over the past three decade, decades, he has developed deep technical expertise and broad leadership experience in steering business and operational priorities within LAM and at Novellus Systems before that. In addition to his work at LAM, Tim serves as chairman of the board for the National GEM Consortium a nonprofit that is dedicated to increasing the participation of underrepresented groups at the master's and doctoral levels in engineering and science. This is something that is particularly relevant and meaningful today, and Caltech applauds Tim for that. This afternoon, Tim will share with us how to take control of your career in his distinguished k &I seminar titled, Rewrite the Rules of What's Possible for Your Career and Technology. I am truly delighted to welcome Tim Archer here today. Welcome, Tim. Very good. Well, thank you, Julia. Let me get my presentation up here real quick. Um, so again, thank you, Julia. And it's a, uh, it's a great honor to be invited here to talk today. Um, I have to admit that 30 plus years ago when I was sitting where most of you are today, I wasn't thinking that I would be back at Caltech talking on any topic, um, let alone my journey from Caltech undergrad to uh, uh, CEO of a global Fortune 500 company. And quite honestly, um, I don't think any of my professors would have thought that I would be either. So, um, you know, that's uh, maybe a surprise for them as well. But over the years, I, I do think I've put my Caltech education to pretty good use. And uh, I would like to thank the faculty and my professor, uh, Noel Korngold, um, uh, sorry, my advisor, um, for helping set me on what has been a, a very rewarding 30 year career in the semiconductor industry. Um, for those that know me, I mean, I don't like talking about myself much, but I was talked into speaking a little bit about my journey from Caltech uh, to where I am today. And so I hope you find this interesting. Now, um, one question that often gets asked is, how did I get to Caltech in the first place? How did I choose Caltech? And so if I look back, I grew up in those early days of PCs. Um, you know, honestly, back when your parents practically had to mortgage their house in order to be able to buy a personal computer. Um, my father was an engineer, which, like probably some of you, that, that sparked my initial interest in engineering. But I was also lucky enough to get one of those very early Apple II computers, which you see here on the screen. Um, it cost around $2,000, which, you know, if you go back to the early 80s and, and you account for inflation, 
that would be about a $6,000 PC today. I mean, it's hard to imagine paying that much for, for a computer these days. Um, it was expensive. And the worst part is it really couldn't do that much, um, at least not by any standards that we have today for personal computing or smartphones or tablets or, or any such. That floppy disk drive you see there on the screen, uh, one disk could actually hold a whopping 140 kilobytes of data. So you would actually need like 10 floppy disks just to store a single picture that today you routinely snap with your smartphone. Um, it's, it's amazing what we've done in the years since. And in fact, if we look back that Apple II computer, a microprocessor in there, it contained about 50,000 transistors. And, and we manufactured those using a 3.5 micron process. So that was 3,500 nanometers for the critical dimension on the chip. Today, we're actually using a seven nanometer process, um, 500 times smaller, and we're packing uh, about 30 billion transistors into a single chip to accomplish what it is that, that we do today and what we take for granted. Um, it is hard to imagine, but that smartphone that, that you're using today and probably holding in your hand, um, it has the compute power of a million PCs from the early 1980s. And uh, maybe even more amazingly, it costs less than one fifth the price. Um, and that, that's really the power. And in fact, it's the magic of the semiconductor industry that over all these years, we have been able to continuously drive this roadmap of performance improvement and cost reduction that today, when you look around, it's, it's, it's allowed electronics to become integrated into our lives in the, in the ways that it, it really has changed how we work and how we live. Um, back in, in the early 1980s, um, a lucky few households had a computer, uh, primarily because of the cost that I just talked about. But today, the average US household has actually more than 10 connected smart devices, whether it's uh, PCs, smartphones, tablets, gaming consoles, um, you name it. Uh, electronics have become just commonplace in our lives. Earlier today, um, if you're watching the news, you might have seen that Apple launched their latest flagship 5G iPhone. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's gonna change the way people are able to connect to the internet, the speeds at which they'll be able to download data. Next month, Microsoft will start shipping um, its new Xbox Series X game console. And what's amazing about that game console is it, it will have 12 teraflops of computing power. And just to put that in perspective for you, um, as recently as 2001, 12 teraflops of computing power would have actually ranked that Xbox Series X as the most powerful supercomputer in the world. And today, here we are, we're gonna use that to play games in our living room. Um, this this, this uh, incredible computing power that we're making it so widely available, um, it's due to the advances we've been able to make in semiconductors and from LAM's perspective in semiconductor manufacturing equipment over these last 30 years. Um, but despite these advances, you know, I, I honestly can say that the, um, the period we're in right now is one of, of, of technology impact in a way that is creating innovation and opportunity like I've never seen before. Um, if you just look around you, whether it's online education or it's telehealth, it's social networking, it's video streaming, um, technology that's enabled by the innovation in semiconductors is um, completely changing um, the world around us. This year, we've seen technology be a powerful answer to many of the, the issues that we faced and the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And while I am fairly certain that social distancing uh, will eventually ease, I am definitely sure that our reliance on technology and our use of technology, that's here to stay. Now, I'll get to that just a little bit later, but before we do, let me back up a little bit. So I'm in high school. I have that, that really cool Apple II computer. Um, I have an interest in engineering. I have perfect grades, like probably all of you who, who are at Caltech, um, great test scores. So what was there for me to worry about? I mean, I should be all ready for Caltech. Um, that's what I thought, but that was also the basis for my first lesson from Caltech. Um, my high school was in a small city in Washington State. Um, it was a great place to live and grow up, but being top of your class still didn't actually mean you were ready for the rigor of Caltech. And uh, no joke, I mean, I think I scored 
something like a 27 out of 100 on my first MA1 calculus test. So if there's any undergrads out there, um, if you look really closely at the bookshelf behind me, you actually might recognize calculus by apostle. I keep it there to um, actually remind me of one of those very first lessons um, of what I, and what I learned at Caltech. But I'm not talking about learning calculus. Um, what I learned is that the world is full of very smart people. And at Caltech, you're surrounded by them every day. Um, that person sitting next to me in that picture that somehow Caltech dug up when we asked for a couple pictures of my days there, um, that person actually, he scored like a 94 on that same test. And uh, maybe it was a stroke of luck, but I, uh, I quickly turned him into my study partner and, and he's been my friend now for more than 35 years. And so you know, a lot about your years at Caltech will stay with you. Um, but when you enter the technology industry, um, whether it's in Silicon Valley, coming to work for a company like LAM Research or somewhere else, whether it's Austin or Boston or any of the other high tech hubs around the country, you're going to find that same environment that you, you've encountered at Caltech. You're going to find a world full of very smart people. And your success will not always come from um, being the smartest or the best at everything. Um, your success will instead come from your ability to collaborate with people and to, to learn from those around you and to use those around you as an inspiration for, for what you can improve and, and how you can be better. And um, that, that's a lesson that I took away from Caltech and it's helped me throughout my career and it's driven me to, to, to really aspire to build high performing teams of incredibly smart people. And I think that that's, that's a very important thing to understand as you transfer uh, and transition into your career. Now, I might not have aced calculus at Caltech, um, but paying attention in APH9, um, solid state electronics for integrated circuits in the applied physics department, um, it really did pay off. And I majored in applied physics, as you heard. Um, I took a strong interest in semiconductor devices and processing. And that's kind of defined my career now for, for the entirety of my, my life so far. Um, I interned for a couple of summers, something I think um, if there's undergrads, it's certainly something you're doing. Um, very commonplace these days. Companies like LAM and others have those opportunities available. Um, I joined a semiconductor company after graduation and, and my first job was as a process engineer, um, processing wafers. Uh, I was responsible for what was called the silicon epitaxy process. And if you've taken something like APH9, you know epitaxy is how we build up those doped layers that become the active part of the transistor. Um, it was a very hands-on job. Uh, I was designing experiments. I was running a lot of the wafers myself. I was measuring them. Um, it was a great way to start a career. Um, in fact, it was a little bit like grad school, but you got paid a little bit, maybe a little bit more. And uh, so it was, a, it was a really nice entry into the, the working world. It helped me build my fundamentals because of the hands-on nature. And I think as you look for your first job, you're really selecting it, you know, understanding what type of work you'll do and how it can continue to kind of build your skills is extremely important. But I also want to say that um, when you have your first job, it's going to be fairly common that after a few years, you start to think about, what's out there. Now I'll say that unless you actually work for a great company like LAM, you might want to stay forever. And we'll have a couple of panelists who've been here almost their entire careers. But you will start to think what else is out there. And so I did, after about five years, um, I started to analyze the structure of the electronics supply chain. And we have this diagram here that you can see. We think of the electronics supply chain as this inverted pyramid where at the top of this pyramid, uh, at the top, which uh, you see there, you have all of the electronics products that you actually know. It's iPhones, it's PCs, it's, um, it's game consoles, everything that makes up that electronics business, that's about $2.1 trillion. It's a huge industry. Um, and at the bottom, you see that you have this weight, what we call wafer fat equipment. That's companies like LAM. We, we make the equipment that makes all the chips that effectively uh, enable the electronics industry. Um, my first job was in the middle. I was responsible for a single 
set of processes um, at a single semiconductor company. And we were making chips that weren't exactly on the leading edge of technology at the time. So when the opportunity came along, with this understanding of you know, different parts that the industry could play, I made a jump to the semiconductor manufacturing equipment segment. Um, and I joined a company called Novellus Systems. And Novellus would later merge with Land Research. What was appealing to me about that segment and that job was that when you're creating those fundamental technologies, you're at the base of that pyramid, that inverted pyramid, um, you have the opportunity to get involved in everything. And so very quickly, I went from being responsible for a single set of processes at a single company to engaging on different processes, different types of chip technology, different end markets, and uh, all over different parts um, of, of the, the industry. It's a very um, good move for me. And I think that, again, understanding how the makeup of the industry when you make that first jump is really important. Um, Today, you know, when you're involved in everything, companies like LAM, we can say that uh, virtually every leading edge device in the world is made using LAM technology. It's something we're very proud of, of having accomplished, but it's only possible because of where we exist within that industry ecosystem. The fact that every customer, every manufacturer of electronics ends up using chips that run through our machines. Um, something important to consider. Now, um, when you think about the industry ecosystem, you think about the breadth of opportunities that any particular job is going to offer you. I think it's important because I do believe that after you make one or two jumps in your career between different companies, like I say, it's pretty natural. I think that it's important for you to find your long-term fit, decide where you want to settle down and dig in and start building your core competency, your skills in that particular industry and also, maybe most importantly, start building this um, professional network. And I'm not talking about a network that's made up of a bunch of LinkedIn contacts or, or um, Facebook friends or Instagram contacts. I I'm talking about a professional network of people inside the company who have different skills, um, different areas of expertise that can help you when you encounter problems with your job uh, or you have uh, questions about how to build your long-term career inside that company, that professional network uh, of people inside the company will be valuable to you. Um, I've been at the same company now, uh, Novellus, and then merging with LAM for 25 years. And I think it's this ability to build that network of, of, of uh, relationships across the company over such a long period of time has really helped me um, succeed when I'm facing very difficult challenges. Um, and also succeed in, in continuing to build and progress my career. So, you know, I do think that jumping around a little bit can be valuable, do it early in your career. And then from that point, really think about building uh, a career for long-term success. Now, I talked about the industry ecosystem and I said that it's, uh, and I talked about staying at one company. I do think that's really important. Um, but it's even more important when you're staying at one company that you continuously challenge yourself with new experiences. Um, one thing you'll quickly learn today is that technology is a global business. And uh, very soon after joining Novellus, I was actually offered um, and asked to move to Japan. Um, I was asked to go run our technology lab, which was located just outside of Tokyo. Now, in the 1990s, you have to understand, Japan was the semiconductor powerhouse region in the world. Um, 1995, I think, uh, top three of the top five semiconductor companies in the world were located in Japan. Um, that's not quite the situation today, but at the time, this was the place to be. It was my first chance to move into management. Um, at the time, I was 28 years old. I'd never been to Japan. I didn't speak a word of Japanese. And to top it off, the, the company, they needed me there in two weeks. Now, when you, when you start your first job and get into business, you're going to quickly realize in business, everything's urgent. So I had to, they wanted me to say yes very quickly so I could actually make this transition in a very short period of time. Um, did this decision cause me to think about and step outside my comfort zone? The answer is yes. Um, in fact, I might have even defined it as the ultimate definition of um, being thrown into the deep end to sink or swim. But 
I will say I jumped in anyway. And quite honestly, I loved it. The challenge of the job, the great Japanese engineers on my team, it was, um, you know, being immersed in Asian culture and just building relationships with customers. It was just a, it's, a, it's an experience I, I really can't describe, but it was so valuable. I was supposed to have been there for two years. I ended up staying for five. And looking back, taking that risk, kind of jumping into the unknown, um, being somewhat unprepared for it, as I said, uh, never having been there, never not speaking the language. Um, it forced me to go in with, with a humility and, and, a, and, a, and an understanding that I would have to learn on that job. And uh, today, if you look at a company like LAM, we operate in nearly 20 countries and that, that international experience gained early in your career um, can be extremely valuable. And so, you know, not everybody gets that opportunity. Not everybody probably um, has the situation where they can take that kind of job. But if you are, um, you find yourself with an opportunity to gain that international experience early in your career, I think it's just, uh, it's just something that, that will always pay dividends for you in, in a, what has become an increasingly globally interconnected world. I came back to the US after a few years. I ran our product groups, not much of a story there, but the next kind of career trajectory changing decision I made was in 2009. Um, there was a, uh, uh, a need for somebody to step up and head our worldwide sales organization. And you know, while unfortunately we're not in person, so I, I haven't met any of the, the attendees here, I'm guessing a lot of Caltech students like myself don't exactly define yourself as an extrovert. Um, you know, I, I would have definitely said I fell into that introverted category. So when I was asked to think about a sales job, I thought, oh, you know, am I really going to enjoy um, meeting people, talking to them about pricing and negotiating uh, on commercial issues? Um, I really wanted to focus on technology. But, you know, despite those reservations, I jumped in, I took this job and, you know, I surprised myself. I really enjoyed that part of the business. and. And you know, if I look back and now uh, before COVID and before COVID shut off all of our international travel, I now in these days find myself traveling, you know, a, a couple hundred thousand, I think last year almost 300,000 miles, meeting customers and, and having discussions, trying to understand their needs. And so I think again, it's um, don't settle into a predefined uh, uh, understanding of what it is you may or may not like. Um, Try different things. Um, anything that can broaden your skill sets, um, and in this case, getting into and getting out of my slightly introverted shell, I think really did help me um, kind of step to that next level, which you know, I became the COO of, of the company um, at the time we merged. And then ultimately, if you kind of look at this, I, I had international experience. I had a technical background, uh, both from Caltech as well as um, many years in the in the product groups. I had now sales, service, and customer experience. Um, maybe it's kind of natural, but in, in 2018, I became the CEO of the company. And good news is, since then, the company's continued to grow. Stock price has uh, more than doubled since I took over. Um, that's obviously very nice, but you heard from Julia a comment about uh, kind of our focus at the company and, and kind of our interest in things like increasing diversity in tech. What most people don't recognize is that um, when you reach that top position, there's something that's even more valuable and more rewarding um, than, than kind of the position and the, and the, the financial rewards. And that's that uh, you're now in a position to, to set the agenda for the company, how to make the company a better place for employees, and also how to make um, the communities in which we do business a better place for everyone. And that's something that I think is becoming um, it's, a, it's a bigger responsibility on corporate executives today, but I think it's generally accepted that companies um, have to innovate and grow while being much more mindful about their social and environmental responsibility. And so um, as you transition to the workplace, you're going to hear a lot more about companies and what we're doing to, to ensure that our communities uh, are benefiting right along with us as we, as we innovate and, and grow. Um, as an example, at LAM, uh, we're, we're strongly committed to um, initiatives around combating climate change. And so we've made uh, commitments around reduce, not only reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2025, but also making our tools 
in a way and, and really innovating around the design. So we use less water, we use less chemicals, less gases, and make uh, our wafer fabs themselves greener. Um, we're also uh, strongly committed to increasing diversity and inclusion and, and heard Julia talk about my role on the GEM consortium. So that's, um, that's really one of the best parts about leading uh, companies. So now let me turn to, to LAM real quick and uh, talk about a couple things that are very important about our technology. We are a leader in global uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Um, so in other words, what you see here is we, we make the, the, the equipment that's used to make all those chips. Um, it's, it's an interesting business. Um, and while most people will think about us as equipment makers, the reality is um, our real value, it lies in the processes that we develop um, to build these incredibly complex three-dimensional structures on wafers. And, you know, I apologize if this video is not playing so clearly for you. Um, it just means that the world needs to continue to increase its uh, internet bandwidth and speed. So we'll get there someday. We're working on it. Um, but if it is playing well for you, what you're seeing is a 256 layer 3D NAND flash chip. And the, the pillars, the, 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 all each of those dots you see there, um, those pillars, they are, um, uh, they require us to actually deposit first 256 alternating layers of oxide and nitride. Um, each of those layers are being about 200 angstroms thick. And then we have to, to etch a perfectly straight hole that's 60 times taller than it is wide. So it's an aspect ratio of 60 to 1. And what's even more amazing is that on a single wafer, we have to be able to simultaneously etch one trillion of those holes accurately in order for our customers to get a high yielding uh, uh, wafer. And so it's, a, it's an incredibly demanding process and one that requires significant innovation. So just in case that video didn't play for you, here's kind of the same thing in an SEM image. This is a 92 layer, so not quite as, as tall as the one I just showed you. It's a 256 gigabit 3D NAND device manufactured by Samsung. And if you happen to have a Samsung phone, pretty sure that, uh, that your data is being stored on a chip like this today. So um, what's, what's happening, and you can kind of see it from that, those, the video or the images, chips are becoming incredibly complex, whether it's new materials or it's uh, um, smaller feature sizes. And that complexity is leading to longer development times and significantly higher costs. What you're looking at here in this chart on the right is, um, is the, the, the typical cost curve that we look for in our industry, which is generation by generation, we have to lower the cost, whether it's the cost per transistor manufacturer or here showing the cost per bit of data storage. Um, and it's supposed to go down every generation. But you see as you get out to what we call the N plus three generation, which is several, several more nodes on the roadmap, um, you start to see deviation from our historic curve. Uh, if, if we can't solve that problem, then innovation and, and adoption starts to slow down. You start to move back towards your smartphone, instead of being $500, will be $1,000, will be $2,000. Maybe you're someday back to that very expensive PC that I had to buy um, way back in the 1980s. And so at LAM, we are investing to try to break uh, the, the challenges that are associated with cost and complexity. And we're, we're funding our R&D towards a pipeline of technologies that we think can be disruptive solutions to this cost complexity challenge. And today, we don't have a lot of time, and so I just want to talk very briefly about two of them, I think that you might find interesting. They're very, very different. One is about equipment, and one is about process technology. The first is what LAM is doing to try to innovate in this, this area called equipment intelligence. Um, and the second is in what we call dry resist for extreme ultraviolet lithography. And so to start on equipment intelligence, um, you know, we see, we see equipment intelligence as this suite of capabilities. You know, the world is now dominated by data. And so we're using in this equipment intelligence strategy data-driven modeling. Um, we're using state-of-the-art tool sensing. These, sen these tools have an incredible number of sensors. Uh, we're using augmented reality with live connected uh, video feeds. 
um, to help our customers accelerate the, the transitioning of new technologies into high volume manufacturing at lower cost. And we think that by bringing these capabilities um, to bear on that problem, we can actually um, have a significant impact. And one of the areas we're, we're trying to impact is in the, the development of new process recipes for these incredibly complex 3D devices. Um, if we take Etch, you're looking at a, a chart here that shows kind of over the years, as we have added um, more control parameters and, and RF generators and new gas chemistries to our Etch tools, the number of recipes that are possible to create on that tool has now reached the point where it's about 100 trillion recipes. And so if you're a process engineer like I was and you come in and you're asked to now develop that perfect recipe on that, that very complex etch tool, um, it's gonna be a pretty hard job for you. And so we are using, as I said, um, data-driven uh, technologies um, to create what we call virtual process development. Um, in other words, if you're looking at this, you're probably all thinking, yeah, it looks like simulation. <laughs> and to some extent, and, and, and very much it is so. But what we do is we're combining physics, our understanding of what's happening inside our machines. We combine that with machine learning and historical data mining to, to try to allow process engineers to better predict the, the best process space in which to start their experimentation. So they can, they can cut down on the potential recipes before they ever start really running wafers on their tool. And, and what you're seeing is in this 3D viewer on the screen is that as we do the work to model each of those different types of steps, um, we can actually then kind of uh, bring them together to start to build the entire device. Because today, most of the problems in manufacturing uh, um, integrated circuits don't always come at the single unit process level. They really start to come when you see this interaction between different layers. And so our goal is ultimately to, to be able to use this virtual process development um, and the, the virtual process uh, virtualization to, to be able to build up these 3D structures on the computer before we ever manufacture them. And you're looking at just kind of an example here of where we've done a pretty good job of modeling now, building up all those steps, and now we can look for the interdependencies that might cause yield problems for our customers. So, this is a, it's a very interesting area of work um, that is trying to start to turn the physical world into the virtual world in the, in the fields of equipment, um, design, development, and process uh, um, activity. Now, uh, to help that, we're also creating smart tools. And so I want to play, again, I don't know if this will quite work for you, but a um, little video here, just uh, smart tools are now equipped with hundreds of different types of sensors that are embedded into the system. We've just launched a brand new tool. It has 400 more sensors than the prior generation. So as electronics come down in cost, we're able to put a lot more different types of sensors into these tools. And from that, we're gathering tremendous amounts of data that we use to compensate for drifts in the process or maybe incoming material variability. And also as what you would have seen in that video if it played smoothly was, um, using that data, the smart tool itself can also trigger self-maintenance. And so what you were seeing in the video was actually parts being replaced automatically by robotics without human intervention. And that's, again, helping simplify what is a very complex manufacturing process for our customers. So there's a lot of work there on robotics, um, data analysis, uh, big data, um, and, and really making decisions about what to do. Um, now, Engineers aren't going to go away. Again, engineers are the ones creating these solutions. Um, and, and engineers quite often are the ones who have to do a lot of the really hands-on work on the tool when it's necessary. And so one of the things we're doing, again, apologize if the video doesn't quite work, but the, uh, we're, we're trying to equip using a couple of new technologies. You're, some of you, if you're gamers out there, you might already be using uh, uh, virtual reality headsets quite routinely. We're using virtual reality headsets to perform training for engineers worldwide. And here you're looking at an augmented reality uh, headset that's being used to enable people who are maybe 7,000 miles away from our factory to actually be real-time connected with experts back at headquarters 
who are now directing them through very complex activities on a tool. And this allows us to be very effective globally. And so again, we're, we're innovating around how to use these new capabilities um, in our work. So dry resist for EUV, this is a little bit different because this is now how we use um, process technology breakthroughs to try to solve that cost complexity challenge. And um, what you're looking at here is uh, a little cartoon diagram of, of the exposure of a photoresist or photosensitive material by EUV. And EUV is actually the, the latest advance in lithography. Um, it's what's required now to print features that are, allow us to build three nanometer devices. Remember I said back in the 80s, we were at 3,500 nanometers. Today we're doing development in R&D at three nanometers. And so um, EUV is, is one of the critical technologies that helps us uh, scale to that point. But there's a lot of trade-offs when you start to, to enter this space and you're seeing it here in this, this triangle um, between resolution, sensitivity, and line edge roughness. And so quite often when you try to optimize one, one corner of the triangle, you end up uh, creating problems for the others. And so uh, usually in our business, what that means is we need to think about new materials. And so as a leader in film deposition and etching, um, we've begun studying photosensitive materials. And what we've been looking to see is how can we make those uh, highly energetic EUV photons that are impinging into this film um, more effective at, at uh, in interacting with the film and creating the latent image we need to create these devices. And so what makes this such a really unique uh, um, innovation from LAM is that for the last 50 years or so, this has been a very um, well understood uh, marketplace. And it's, it's, it's actually been a technology that has been driven by using um, wet chemistries. So uh, I think even back in my days in APH9, you would you'd spin the wet photoresist onto the film and then you'd expose that. Um, today, what we're finding is that in order to use those wet chemistries, you have to load it up, not only with the absorbers for the EUV photons, but also with viscosity agents with, uh, with stabilizers for the film. Those problems all go away when you, when you convert to dry technology. And so LAM is, is driving this charge towards the conversion and the disruption of wet technology to dry technology for better control, um, better film properties, and ultimately lowering the cost of EUV introduction. Um, and that's what we've been doing. It also, I mentioned our corporate responsibility and our commitment to the environment. Eliminating those wet chemistries and all of the, the chemicals that are inside of there were, uh, is actually a good thing for the planet. And, and what we're seeing is that um, when we convert to the dry solution, we are able to deliver for our customers about a five to 10 X reduction in waste uh, and cost. And because our photosensitive material uh, makes better use of those impinging EUV photons, we actually can reduce the power um, by about 2x from what's uh, typically required with wet resist. So less waste, less energy consumption, um, it, and lower cost for our customers. It's, it's almost the perfect type of solution. And it's the kind of thing that, that our engineers are driving. Now, uh, I know that was very quick, but hopefully those two examples at least give you some sense of the breadth of opportunity. I talked at the very beginning. Pick a company that has a lot of different um, activities in which you can engage. If you look at the types of subject areas that LAM focuses on, um, almost every type of chemistry, we're a very material focused company. Plasma physics, we're the leader in plasma etching and plasma deposition. Um, of course, material science, engineering, and, and really more recently, I showed you with equipment intelligence, data science, um, software, robotics, uh, control systems. These are all becoming incredibly important in building the smart tools of the future. And so um, I think that is Lamb's story. And uh, what I'd like to do now um, as I finish up this presentation is uh, we're gonna let you meet some of the, the uh, other people who work at Lamb, uh, Caltech graduates. And, I think they'll be able to tell you a little bit more about uh, some of this as well. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over, I believe, to Julia. That was such an inspiring talk. Thank you, Tim. We will now move on to the second portion of our event, 
a panel discussion with some of our Caltech alumni who now work at LAMP. Tim will moderate the session. Hopefully he's getting a drink of water now because that was a lot of, um, uh, a lot of talking. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to remind the audience to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions. There will be panelists, um, and Tim, of course, will be available. And um, I really encourage you to reach out and to submit all of your questions using the Q&A uh, feature. Okay, I think that's my clue to come back in. And uh, <laughs> I would like to, uh, to introduce uh, um, four very special guests. These are uh, LAM employees. Um, they've been uh, with the company for different lengths of time, which means that I think that they will be able to provide um, very unique perspectives, I think, on, on what it's like to, to make the transition in the industry and, and kind of build a career at a company uh, in the semiconductor industry. So first, I would like to introduce Eric Edelberg. Um, Eric is uh, Vice President General Manager of our um, deposition product group, responsible for uh, a number of different deposition products. The one that I'm very proud of, the, uh, the Sabre electroplating tool that I worked on way back in 2001. Um, Eric has a BS in chemical engineering, uh, graduated, I guess, 1993. And I guess since Julia said it, I think, Eric, you're also Fleming House. Okay, there you go. I think you're muted, Eric. I'm going to turn myself on again. I think that degrees in chemical engineering and being undergrads at Caltech go a long way. <laughs> the, uh, the second person I'd like to introduce is John Parks. Um, John is uh, Director of Engineering in our Customer Support Business Group and uh, BS Mechanical Engineering 1994, um, 18 years with LAM Research. Um, the next is Kevin Gu. Um, Kevin is in our office of the CTO. And uh, actually Kevin is, uh, is actually working on that dry really exciting dry resist uh, development project that's being done in our, our CTO's office, our Chief Technology Officer's office. Um, and he is a process engineer much more recently with the company, graduated 2013 with a BS in chemical engineering. So welcome, Kevin. And finally, we have Amanda Shing. Amanda, our most recent uh, um, alumni. H, uh, she is in the Etch product group. She's a process engineer, just graduated with her PhD in material science in 2016. And we were very happy to have Amanda join our company and, and uh, happy to have her join here today as well. As one of the more recent graduates and very, Therefore, maybe much more connect, you, you and Amanda, most, mostly connected to the, uh, the current group of students that we're dealing with here. And, and the question I have for you is, um, as you were approaching graduation, how did you decide between, and, and maybe both of you actually have different answers, as, uh, you, you have an answer, Kevin, of, um, how did you decide between an industry job or continuing on to graduate school or um, some other choice you might have had. I don't know, traveling the world or whatever you might have. How did you, how did you choose a company like LAM and, and our industry? Yeah, sure. So um, one thing that I'll just mention real quick, Tim, uh, I did my PhD at Stanford after uh, finishing my undergrad at Caltech and I graduated in 2018. So I think among this group, I actually hold the title of the newest. Oh, the recent, the newest. Okay, well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to flop that. But yeah, to answer your question, uh, I'll preface this by saying that I was kind of a bit of an oddball in the sense that I've sort of always known that I wanted to get a PhD and then work in industry. My dad is a professor, and so I grew up kind of seeing what the academic life was like. And, you know, as, as an academic, you, you find an interesting phenomenon, you characterize it, you publish a paper, and a lot of the times the train kind of just stops there unless you go do a startup, which is rare. But for me, while I really enjoyed the science, I felt that I got the most intellectual stimulation out of taking an idea and sort of carrying it across the finish line all the way to making a final product. And so for me, it was never really a question from about middle school that I wanted to go into industry. Great. Well, thanks, Kevin. Um, maybe, uh, and, 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 uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think a uh, great answer. John, how about you? Uh, um, any, any thoughts on this? How did you, how did you make that, that choice? Although it was quite a, quite a number of years before, uh, before Kevin had to make the choice. Yeah, yeah, it took me a while to get there. I mean, for me, it was, I, I didn't go get a graduate degree. I went right into industry. I, I started off interning at Dow Chemical of all places, one of the makers of the, the wet chemical resist <laughs> that we're trying to get rid of. Um, but in, 
and, and similar motivations to Kevin, it, I started off in new product development um, and the power of being able to think of something, draw it on a whiteboard, uh, drafting table now in 3D CAD and being able to take something that was an idea and make it into reality uh, is something that um, you can get that in academics, but you don't get the same, you know, at least I don't think you get the same amount of uh, return, immediate return on investment um, from your efforts uh, that you get going into industry and where it's really prioritized, particularly at, you know, at our company and, and others like it to, to really drive that innovation. Great. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's not really clear. I know when I was in school, I didn't fully understand industry, but I think for the students, I mean, what, what John does, I mean, this customer support business group and everything he engineers immediately ends up out at the customers. And so when he's talking about like engineering something and then that, that immediate feedback of how it's working and whether it's solving the customer's problem, um, it, it can be very rewarding to, to, uh, when you get it right. Can be very challenging when you get it wrong as well. So, but it's a it's a very closed loop process, and, and I think very uh, very interesting. Um, Eric, I got a I got a question for you. Um, once you were looking for uh, that industry, your first industry job. I mean, how did you think about the type of company? I, I you heard my story. I mean, kind of I don't know how I lucked into it or or what, but uh, um, how did you choose what industry yeah. to go into? Well, I had a unique experience in that my graduate school advisor was uh, funded uh, through a grant from LAM Research. And as part of my uh, PhD thesis project, I actually did a six month internship uh, at LAM. You know, and it was, uh, I mean, I, I, I learned the, the thing that I learned the most, which I think is still one of the most valuable things that I. Uh, take out of my job today is how important it is to collaborate with people of different backgrounds and of experience. I mean, I was a plasma physicist. I, yeah, I know plasma, but you, I came up here with my project and there was someone that was showing me how to do circuit design, someone that was, you know, building filters so that we could filter out RF and this, you know, this thing that we were in, uh, putting, developing a diagnostics tool to put into a LAM product. There were software engineers and you realize that it's a, the team is what it takes to actually be successful. Um, so, and when I went back to graduate school and I finished, um, you know, I had some other job opportunities, but I just remember not only did I network with the people there and learn that, you know, the culture of the company and everyone was just having a good time and, you know, doing great things. And that's how I made that decision. It was actually a very easy decision. Great. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, it's also very interesting. So the tool that you, one of the, one of the systems you're responsible for today definitely uses no plasma physics whatsoever. Right? <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, a big, a big uh, change in my career. I mean, I looked at yours, how, you know, much variability and I have had six jobs. I've been in this company 20 years. I have never been bored for one minute because, yeah. you know, there's always something new challenge, new thing to learn about. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, uh, I think that being open to, to different things is uh, in your career is very important. Which brings me to Amanda. I don't know if it's even fair to ask you this question, Amanda, given you haven't you know, been with the company that long. Um, but it says, you know, the question was, are you still doing what you, you thought you wanted to do when you graduated? Or um, have your interests changed since, since you, you graduated and moved into industry? So I've been with the company four years, actually. <laughs> uh, a little bit longer than Kevin. Um, and initially in graduate school, I was studying solar cells. I was in Harry Atwater and Nate Lewis's groups uh, and saw at the beginning, uh, you know, solar companies were good. And then in the middle, all solar companies were kind of disappearing. Um, but semiconductors and solar cells are one in the same too. It's just uh, now I'm looking at the um, different types of devices, um, flash memory right now in particular. And in my graduate program, I took care of a lot of vacuum instruments and I use a lot of vacuum instruments today. So it was an easy transition. Uh, why going into LAM um, was my final choice. Uh, I would say it was because I 
didn't exactly have to choose at that moment. LAM has this rotation program for uh, graduates. Um, it's called the NCG uh, rotation program. And that's what attracted me to LAM in the first place uh, because I could get experience um, as a field engineer like Tim was. I could get experience um, as maybe a supply manager or as a process engineer or as uh, something else um, related to the company. Right now they've even expanded it towards more of the data science areas and um, I don't know, all business areas, I think, the new emerging business areas. So there's there was a lot of things that I wanted to learn about in industry and that rotation program kind of uh, had that uh, going. That's why um, maybe I didn't have to choose necessarily uh, or expect anything when I left graduate school. Great, well, thanks, thanks for pitching that for us. I, uh, I, I, uh... You know, I guess that rotation program, I mean, to, you know, I talked a little bit at the beginning about like the, one of the great parts once you sort of get to where you're, you're leading a company is, uh, um, you know, I talked about my view of like this rotation or like trying different things. And we have started this program that Amanda is one of, uh, one of the participants in where you rotate between three different parts of our company. And that way, actually, like, I didn't think about it from the point of not having to pick right at the beginning, but you get to to sort of see what are the different jobs and where might your skills and, and interests fit best at the start. And um, hopefully you found it valuable, Amanda, but it's something that we continue to expand in our company because we recognize people aren't always ready to, to make that choice right out of school and, and we do want to find the right fit. So It actually certainly has expanded. Instead of only six people, they're taking like 12 to 20 people for their rotation as a graduate yeah. and they've expanded to do um, already employed uh, engineers or other employees as a rotation as well. So um, I think if you have been in a group for a while and you want some experience or have been collaborating with another group, you can go ahead and try to apply and um, be able to rotate even as an experienced employee. Great. So maybe I'll be rotating again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So uh, um, there was a question that came in from, from the audience. And so I'd like to, uh, to, to maybe field this one. Um, anybody, actually, whoever wants to take this one, maybe we'll start with uh, Kevin. Um, how would you, you know, you're, you're pretty new to the company, but how would you um, see the, the PH, your PhD degree being valued um, as you as you look to build your career in the industry, certainly doesn't hurt. That's for sure. But um, I'll just recount an experience I had with a colleague of mine when I first started in ATD. So for the first, I want to say, and first year of working with this guy, I had absolutely no clue that he did not have a PhD. He was a master's, and he had worked at LAM for about four or five years. So we were basically the same age. We were the same level. We were contributing to the same. I had absolutely no indication because this guy was performing at the same level as you'd be expected to with a PhD. So I would say that the doors aren't really closed for you if you don't have a PhD. But the training that you get of going through the program, it trains you to think more or less like a scientist and evaluate hypotheses. So it certainly doesn't hurt, but I don't think I've seen an example of anyone being held back, having doors closed in their face because they didn't hold the degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, great perspective. How about you? How about you, Eric? You've been uh, well a little bit longer, so you've seen. Uh, how, how do you think it's helped you, or uh, would you maybe have done something differently? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I I kind of agree with everything Kevin said because um, I've learned so much from so many different people as I've been here, and not everybody has a PhD. And I came in as a plasma physicist in the plasma etch group, and I was like, I know a lot of stuff about this, but I've had six different jobs and three of them, only two of them were had anything to do with plasma. And now I run a group that has nothing to do with plasma or vacuum. So, um, you know, I think that uh, the degree is like Kevin said, it's a good experience for critical thinking, it's problem solving. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that degree is very applicable to things at LAM and sometimes it's not, but it's, you know, it's definitely uh, something that when you get here, you learn from so many people uh, that you 
you can, it's not a door closer by any means. It's definitely lots of opportunities either way. Yeah. Okay. John, any different perspective is, uh, uh, I guess you and I are the ones who, uh, who didn't go get the PhD. So <laughs> as the non PhD uh, part of the crowd, but no, I think, uh, you know, at lamb in particular, people are, you know, measured more by their accomplishments by their, than by their degrees. Um, that being said, you know, does a PhD potentially open up a few more doors than not having one for sure? But um, after you've been in the company for three, four years, people are going to be looking more at what you've done and less at your degree. Um, at least that's been my experience uh, within the company. Um, so, I, I mean, I wouldn't discourage anybody from getting one if that's what they truly wanted. Um, but it's, it's not a necessity for the most part. I think that, you know, I think Kevin really kind of hit it, which was, uh, you know, it's about, it's about critical thinking skills and, and analytical skills. I talked about the importance of data, um, the importance of problem solving in industry. You know, obviously the, the PhD helps, you know, you see people come in, they're, they're, they're further up on that maturity curve. But just as Amanda described with rotation programs and other things, I think if you pick, you know, what I was trying to explain with, if you pick a, an industry where you are, you know, working on sort of fundamental capabilities, you actually can continue to use industry also as a as a, a learning and, and and vehicle for gaining new experiences. So, you know, I really don't think there's any one right answer, and, and uh, but I I think it's it's something that uh, uh, maybe the real answer is regardless of where you uh, what degree you get, the idea of continuing to learn throughout your entire career is probably the most important um, aspect. And, I think otherwise it's a little bit of personal choice. We clearly have many examples of very uh, successful people with or without PhDs uh, in our company. Um, there's a, uh, maybe, maybe, I guess I'll let you guys decide. This was a question of, from the audience as well. What was the biggest challenge transitioning from research and development, uh, from a research and academic environment to a business one? So maybe, uh, I don't know, Amanda or Kevin, maybe one of you two want to take that one? Since you're... Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so sort of dovetailing on the previous question about, you know, having a PhD, whatnot. Um, I remember when I was, you know, younger, five, six years ago, going to these types of seminars, I was thinking, oh, gosh, what happens if I do a PhD and it's completely unrelated to what I want to get a job in? And that's exactly what happened. I worked in organic solar cells for my PhD, and then I ended up working at LAMB Research on photoresist project. So there's sort of that. And then um, to, to tie into the question earlier, um, actually, I'm sorry, Tim, could you sort of remind me again the phrasing? Transitioning from a research and academic yeah. environment like, you'd, like you really would get in your, your PhD work. Right, yeah. Industry job. Like what's different? How hard was the transition? What was right, yeah, sorry. So that was a completely different world for me. So not only switching fields completely, but going from research, which is more relaxed, more contemplative, a little bit slower, to the incredibly fast-paced world of R&D and uh, industry. And that was a bit of a shock to me, just thinking that things go as slow as you would imagine to have to be contemplative, but that's just not how things work. So I had to learn very quickly to speed up sort of lose a couple of you know, loose ends here and there in order to get the core of the answer and be 90% sure about things. So that was a big mental transition for me. Okay, great. Um, Amanda, for me, you... oh, oh okay, I just please. wanted to respond to that. For me, what was uh, more of a change and maybe I want to highlight is everybody wants to talk to you maybe about projects in graduate school. People have time, like Kevin said, to chat about projects and we'll sit and listen. Uh, in the industry, everybody's quite busy and maybe they don't have time to just chat about projects. What about uh, some different theories that you have going on? They, um, they will be working on things and you have to actively go find them and then try to get maybe 10 minutes of their time. So uh, maybe even being a little bit more aggressive and then doing things really succinct succinctly and not really discussing all the theories that you have behind you. Uh, that, that I think certainly you should uh, highlight if you're going into industry. Um, it's not going to be everybody wants to hear the greatness of the science. It's going to be 
I only have five minutes. Is this what you're telling me? <laughs> or only have five minutes. Oh, great. You've told me everything I need to know. And um, sure, whatever you want is fine. Or what are the next steps here that uh, you want me to take notice of? Okay, great. Amanda, I'll let you take this next one too. So uh, can you list two traits or skills that you find helpful in an industry career? Well, one of them was the one that I just mentioned, just mm -hmm. being aware to um, try to talk to people. Yeah. Um, and one thing that is hard, you take for granted in graduate school, people wanting to talk to learn from each other. And uh, because you're not really getting that opportunity to talk so much and discuss uh, at work in industry, you maybe lose out uh, if you don't actively go and try to do that in, in industry. So uh, being able to reach out to people, talk to them, build your network, as Tim said, that I think is important. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I'm happy you mentioned that. I mean, I, I believe that, you know, at LAM and, and I think in industry, you know, collaboration is, is incredibly important. I mean, our, these, these problems have become so complex that uh, uh, we have to work together across disciplinary and uh, in a very cross-disciplinary way to, uh, to solve problems. Um, John, maybe a quick question for you. Can you, uh, can you give an example of what it's like to take an idea or prototype and develop it into a product or practice at LAM? Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, we've done uh, several products, uh, some of which I'm responsible for supporting now. So maybe I should have spent a little bit more time developing them <laughs> in that process. But uh, like, like I said earlier, I, I think you, we have opportunities. Our customers have problems all of the time. We don't get to uh, develop our product to the exact way that our customer intends to use it uh, because the industry moves so fast. So um, you know, we've done new product development where you literally start with a blank piece of paper and you just start drawing up what the entire system is going to look like. Um, and those take a little bit lo longer. I know, Tim, you've had this incentive, to, you've, this initiative to try to get it down to under 12 months and the time I've been doing it's usually around 18. And then there are projects that literally two days later, you've had a concept for something and you're building it with additive manufacturing and you're testing it at a customer site. All of those things have different degrees of satisfaction that come from them. Um, you know, the larger scale ones are a little bit more delayed and the smaller scale ones, you know, you get a quick turnaround and you can diffuse a high pressure situation a lot of times by, by being able to do it, um, to, to execute to, to that project. And so for me personally, I take a great deal of pride in being able to create something uh, that didn't exist prior to a thought that may have occurred is long ago is 18 months and is, you know, as recent as yesterday, um, being able to provide a solution to our customers. Great. Thanks. Actually, you brought up a really good point, you know, and, and, and it's something that I've seen, I'm, you know, and, and Caltech is definitely is true, you know, this uh, emergence of sort of these maker spaces. And you mentioned additive manufacturing and it's, is it, there's these skills that like today just are emerging that we didn't, uh, we didn't really have and, and capabilities we didn't have 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, Eric, in your world, are, are, is your team engaged with, with new technologies like additive manufacturing, 3D printing? Yes. Effectively of parts to accelerate prototyping? Any yeah. examples you might have? Yeah, well, you know, I, it's interesting because one of the products, the one uh, that you worked on uh, in the beginning, uh, you know, it's, it's a fairly established product. And, you know, it, I think these, you know, we, we design things a certain way based on what you can do at the time. Uh, and there's some things that you make six pieces to put it together because you can't drill, you know, you can't build it like an additive machine can do. So you got to drill holes and then put these things together. And we constantly go back whenever we have to do any kind of in develop or improvement or we have an escalation where something's and we're, and I tell my team every time, if you're going to touch it before you just fix the problem, think about you're going to touch it, so you might as well make it better. You know, is there an opportunity? Can we develop it, do it a different way? And so we we look at that in the context of, you know, is it easier to build? Is it, you know, cost less to build? Is it going to be more reliable? Uh, and all of those things from legacy parts or legacy designs have to be reconsidered. And we're that's kind of a, a uh, something that we always try to do when we're looking at uh, changing or touching something on the tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. 
Yeah, so I think uh, for those of you who students out there spending your time in maker spaces using all of that equipment, it, it especially when you get to like the equipment space, we really build things. I mean, it, we're, we're almost the definition of like a, a maker space. It's just what we build. They're about the size of, what would you guys say, like a small minivan and they, they cost uh, sort of about $10 million. So you know, it's, uh, it's a little different than what you might be working on, but uh, very much the same idea. Like we just made a, an investment in a company um, that's working on some very innovative uh, 3D printing of metal, um, metal parts, different types of metals in order to build uh, um, some of the pieces of, uh, of tooling for our systems. So uh, just amazing advances all the time. Um, one question, actually this one, I guess, I guess maybe I'll take it, but then one of you can also uh, answer this. It was, what are some of the most important elements for success of running a large division or company? Well, I, I talked a little bit about that from the standpoint of how you, how I kind of got to run the large company, but really once you're running the company, um, you know, there's a lot of different challenges, but what you quickly find, and I would just say it's the, the it is the secret to success is, um, I mentioned it about building teams and and really trying to focus on people. And so we spend an enormous amount of time inside the company focused on um, trying to develop people. Amanda talked about the rotation program, get people started off on the right track early in their career. Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that, that picking the right people um, and, and helping them advance early in their career just is, is what the company, what will make the company successful. Our, our business, like almost all technology businesses, is, is completely governed by the people who work for you, the ideas they come up with, the problems they can solve. And so I think the success is just focus on your employees, um, build as good a team as you can, and uh, point them in the right direction relative to the business you're in. And, and uh, you see the people here really, really are the ones who have contributed everything. Um, you know, Eric, you run a you run a large division in the company. What would what would your answer be that's different than mine? <laughs> yeah, well, I I mean, I don't know how different it would be, but I think you know, because I've changed jobs so many times and I'm I have experience, uh, but I don't always have you know the some of the knowledge, and I've learned to depend on the team members. When I joined a group, I didn't understand the process. I didn't understand how this tool was designed, how it works. So the key is empowering people, listening to people, you know, you know, evaluating everyone's opinion. And, you know, you can be the boss, but it doesn't mean you know everything. You, ha you have to acknowledge that there are subject matter experts that will will help you and help the organization be successful. And you need to listen to everybody and everybody ha comes from a different angle and has different experiences and they all are value valuable and contribute to the success of the organization and the team. I have a question for Amanda. Um, you, you mentioned the rotation program and the field engineer job. What was it, what's it like, what's it like working out in the customer site? Um, on the tools? What's the, what's the environment like? I mean, how, how did you find that job? It depends on who's your uh, customer manager. But uh, when I was at Intel Hillsboro, what I did was start up some new LAM tools on campus. So I went into their big fab with all the robots and uh, we were supposed to deliver them the working full tool so they can go take over and uh, qualify it for their processes and uh, we were late <laughs> so some of the managers got a little bit testy um, but some of them were like oh this is usual all of the vendors are usually late uh, it depends on the manager um, but I did really enjoy how the group of field engineers, uh, even though I was only staying there for six months, they took me and the other rotation employees in, they trained us and um, gave us small projects to do, help us, helped us out when we had a, some little escalations with items. And uh, I hope we helped them out just as much as they helped us out. Uh, not sure on that, but uh, it was a good experience and made me see the life at the customer site, how people uh, at the customer site communicate with people here at Fremont, uh, where I transferred to and um, have been since then, and just how to uh, make those um, 
communications because now I'm at the Fremont site, but I now communicate with field engineers in uh, China. Um, mm -hmm. So doing the reverse of what I was asking for some Fremont engineers for me. Yeah, great. That maybe leads into this question that just came in from the audience. It's a great one. Um, so Kevin, be careful how you answer it. Uh, how's the work-life balance at LAM? I think I got lucky in the sense that I get to decide what that is. I mean, I don't think I've worked less than 40 hours ever. And mostly my days are dictated by how much work I want to do. I mean, at least twice a week, I get chastised by my wife saying, Kevin, it's 10 o'clock. You got to put the computer down. But the thing is, I just want to work on it. So if I wanted to slow down a little bit and had other things going on in my life, it's certainly possible. And so I'd never felt like I had to make a choice between work and life. It was always up to me. Okay, great answer. Anybody have a different answer? <laughs> I, I think it's a great question. It's a very fair question because, you know, obviously, you know, our business, as we've talked about, it's, it's highly competitive. It's, uh, it's a global business, which means that, you know, even when you're sleeping, you got customers running and trying to develop processes, you know, around the world. Um, we do generally a lot of travel, um, if that's what you want to do. But kind of in, as Kevin just pointed out, you know, that is something that in a company where, you know, again, this point of like not being too fixed on any one thing, realizing every job has something to offer you, you can kind of choose a little bit by the direction. You know, you might be working on more fundamental development, maybe a little more control. If you're involved in customers, like Amanda just talked about, maybe a little less control at times because <laughs> you're driven by their schedule and their times. But um, it's something we do focus on. I talked about, you know, a focus on employees. And I guess all I'd say is uh, if we don't create a great work-life balance for our employees, we don't keep them. And, and what you see at LAM is um, we have more than, I don't know what the latest numbers are, but we have uh, uh, something like over a thousand, 1,500 employees or something that have now been here about 20 years. And so, and we have many thousands who've joined recently as the company continues to grow. Um, but, you know, we really focus on making that work-life balance um, work for people. And, and I think that by having many different choices inside the company, that's one way to do it. But like Kevin said, and like Amanda said, others, I think it's just people get caught up in the work and you really, if you're really inspired by what you're doing, it's a little easier choice. So um, I think that might be, uh, that might be time to turn it back over to, uh, to Julia. Um, Julia, if you want to come back in. And... Absolutely. Before we close, I have one last question that I'd like to ask all the panelists and Tim. In hindsight, what advice would you give to your younger self? Okay, um, I'll start with this. Uh, so probably two things, and I've, I think Tim said one and uh, I alluded to one, but to me, um, don't be afraid to step outside of your comfort zone, you know, and, um, and just, you know, collaborate, don't, you know, make, make collaboration and respecting other people's opinions and input a key part of how you do things every day. That is, that is such great advice, actually. All right. Yeah. So, so Eric and I didn't collaborate on this. That was mine, but I'll, I'll have a second one uh, that I, I, I think is uh, some advice I got actually in my first internship. They assigned a mentor to me. Um, and one of the things he told me was, this is obviously the days before Facebook and things like that, but it was, you know, you're only going to have so, so many contacts in your life that are going to be able to you know, sort of change the direction of whatever it is you're doing. And you're not going to know who those people are um, when you first meet them. So I, I think as you meet people and you talk about building your network, try to make sure each of those interactions is something that, you know, you, you extract some value from, but also you provide some value to the other person as well. Great advice. Yeah. You, Kevin? If I was to talk to my younger self, I'd probably say that you should develop your soft skills in grad school a little bit more when you have the chance, specifically learning to manage up. So what I mean by that is, you know, you have your manager when you start working at LAM and they're fantastic in some areas and not so great in others. So being able to work with your manager requires sort of management upwards, so to speak. So I would advise myself to pay a little bit more attention to that, pay a little more attention to 
even just politics going on in the lab because those soft skills are a lot more valuable than I originally thought. That's great advice. Amanda? And for me, I would say um, maybe similar along the lines of Eric, but uh, when I was in grad school, I spent a lot of time really focused on my project and trying to uh, work on that to graduate. Um, I didn't really get a lot of chances to explore outside of my project. So I think looking back, I would have, I would have said be a little more rebellious, uh, go explore some other things before um, graduating. Uh, that would be my advice to myself because I, I think uh, after I graduated now, I just don't really have a lot of time <laughs> to do that so much so, even though with rotating, but uh, um, being able to do it in grad school, you get a lot more flexibility for that, hopefully. It depends on your advisor. It's good I didn't let you answer the work-life balance question then, but <laughs> actually your answer, I'm really proud of you because that, that answer is, uh, stole my answer. Um, but you know, actually, you know, as you, uh, I'm kind of in that point right now of almost being able to give advice to my younger self because I have a daughter who just started as a freshman in college this year. So we'll see what, what advice I give her. It's actually pretty tough, but I think that a little bit like Amanda said is, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know exactly what the profile of, of Caltech students are that are on this call. Um, hard driven, fast, can't wait to get there, <laughs> want to get to wherever you're going. And uh, I think this idea of like slowing down a little bit, I don't know if it'd be rebellious, but it'd be, I don't know, I want my daughter to be rebellious, but I guess it'd be um, explore more. And that's, that's something that I honestly, it's like, uh, you know, I was... I was uh, kind of very fixated on what I wanted to do. And, and you, know, you, you take up your time with internships and you go and you get a job. And, and uh, while it's been in, an incredible career and I'd say life so far for me, um, you know, I, do, I, I would probably go back and encourage myself to try a few different things. And you, know, you hate to say enjoy college a little bit more, but it, uh, you know, there's probably a little bit more time I could have fit in for a few other things. And so um, that's been my advice to the younger self, which is my, my daughter, actually, and we'll see how well she does it. She's studying aerospace engineering and probably no matter what advice I give her, it'd probably be the exact same story. So um, in any case, I think it's just uh, enjoy college. Your job will come very soon. And uh, at that point, your life will be uh, kind of into its next phase. So great. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for your younger self and your daughter is that you can't give that advice as a parent, right? You can give that advice right. to your younger self, but you can't be a good parent to give that advice. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so. <laughs> well, these are all great responses. Um, and I particularly resonate with Amanda's point that you either have time or money. Right, so you your grad student, you have all the time, but you maybe <laughs> you know, and then you get a job, and you uh, have uh, to worry about the serious, <clears throat> the serious career, and maybe not have as much time on your hands. So, on behalf of the Kavli Nanoscience Institute, I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, you're such talented alums, and you came back to Caltech in such a meaningful conversation. So, thank you very much, and I really hope that next time we can all meet in 3D. That would be uh, that would be my my advice to all of our current uh, selves. So thank you very much, and please enjoy your evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julia. Thank you.